Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Phil Radford, Executive Director of Greenpeace, an organization which was founded in 1971 and is the largest direct action environmental organization in the world today. Phil has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Phil, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So Greenpeace has loomed very large over the last 30 years. It has an incredible reputation and incredible impact. Describe Greenpeace. Greenpeace is the world's largest organization that runs campaigns and advocates for the planet and for peace and disarmament. Um, we are in 42 countries, anywhere from the Congo to Brazil to Indonesia to the U.S. Um, we have about 4,000 staff and millions of volunteers and activists. And we ultimately work on the world's greatest threats, whether it's the depletion of all the fish in our oceans, whether it's the disappearance of biodiversity that supports our life, um, or climate change or nuclear testing. We tackle the biggest issues, do it in a peaceful, principled way, and have a long history of global victories. It's, it's a very interesting concept to, in, to incorporate the green side and the peace side. Uh, talk about how that came about and, and how that philosophy informs your programs uh, and, and your operation, how you implement those programs. Well, Greenpeace was started by reporters, Quakers, and draft dodgers. Uh, they were all up in Canada during the Vietnam War, and the environmental movement was being born. There's clearly a, a significant peace movement against the Vietnam War. And uh, some of the members of Greenpeace were Sierra Club chapter members, um, some were peaceniks, some reporters, and they heard that the U.S. government was testing a nuclear bomb off of Alaska. And there are several issues with that. One is the, the people who were fighting for peace at the time obviously thought nuclear weapons were a disaster. Um, the bomb was being tested on a bird sanctuary, and so the people that cared about conservation were concerned. And people thought that the bomb might trigger a tsunami. Um, and we've seen with Fukushima that nuclear explosions can, you know, can cause serious impacts. So um, they formed a committee called the Don't Make a Wave Committee, both because they didn't want a tsunami and because they were told by people that they shouldn't protest this nuclear testing. So from day one, it, you know, Greenpeace brought together Quakers, peaceful activists, uh, conservationists, people fighting for peace, and they went out and they just put their bodies on the line. They had no idea what to do, but they just rented a little ship and sailed out into the blast zone to get in the way to stop it. Eventually, they you know, were turned back by the Coast Guard. There were bad sailors, and so they were turned back by weather. Um, and on one of their final voyages out to try to block the nuclear test, they named their ship the Greenpeace. And people all over the world didn't know what the group was called and saw the ship and said, we'd like to be a part of that. We'd like to be a part of Greenpeace. And that's how it was born. So the next phase, you have now an initiative that has drawn some attention. It was a, it, it, it was it was very messy. Um, there was a lot of incompetence, uh, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of uh, joy, uh, a lot of setbacks. Um, but you have now the attention of the world. What happens next in in Greenpeace's evolution? Well, I think you know in the in the kind of the messiness and the craziness and people, you know. Uh, getting in a boat and just going out to get in the middle of a nuclear test, there was a theory of change. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a few things happening. So you had, great, uh, you had great communications theorists at the time that realized that the television was the new campfire. That's where all stories and all narratives were starting to be transferred into society instead of around the campfire in the past. And so the original Greenpeace leaders and activists realized that if they could create a really good, powerful story on television, that would create the narratives of the day. So that was the first, and then there was also a, a deep belief in principled, peaceful confrontation, where, as we all know, on television, conflict sells. And so as long as you do it with, with principles and peacefully, going out there and putting yourself on the line, and then creating that story around the modern campfire, which was the television at the time, um, was a way to start to really change the way that people thought about our society and about the biggest threats to it. So there were the connections between violence, uh, uh, violence against people, and violence against the environment. There was the idea of, of storytelling. Mm -hmm. There was the idea of putting oneself on the line. Mm -hmm. And there was the idea of in putting oneself on the line, one did it in the traditions that had emerged in terms of, of peaceful but confrontational 
um, uh, action uh, in which you are putting yourself, your, your, your physical body, your being uh, on the line for a cause, making a statement that the cause is as important as one's life. Absolutely, yeah. And I think Greenpeace works in many ways. We research, we publish reports, we lobby, we uh, lobby the UN, the US government, the Chinese government. But there are some issues that at times are so important that you just need to stand up and get in the way. And I think nuclear testing was one of those examples. I think global warming is certainly one of those examples. And later we became known for getting in the way of the harpoon to save the whales, uh, using non-toxic dye to spray two-week-old fur seals so that their white fur uh, wouldn't be used for coats. Um, you know, and just a lot of different ways of creatively and peacefully blocking things from happening and highlighting what's happening to the world. And w what is also interesting is that diversity that you mentioned. You have the direct action tradition which continues. Uh, but you also have these other policy uh, areas, areas where you are resourced to uh, other nonprofits, governments, um, and and actually um, uh, businesses who in the who in in uh, some iterations, some some actions are uh, organizations that you oppose. You know, in a way, you always see the tip of the iceberg above the water, and you don't see all of the iceberg under the water. That's a lot like Greenpeace. People know what they see on TV, and people know that they've seen really you know impressive events or actions that we've done. And what they don't see is that for every one company we get to change, we've negotiated the same change with about nine companies. Um, we spend a lot of our time in the US now working to get big companies to change their supply chains, of all things. Um, so an example is in Brazil, the largest driver of deforestation was cattle ranching. And our Brazilian office, where we have about 80 staff, met with the government and said, we'd like you to stop any cattle ranching on recently deforested land. Uh, the government didn't do anything. Then we met with the big cattle ranching companies, and of course they didn't do anything. And in Brazil, there's a lot of corruption. Um, there is fairly weak enforcement of the law by the government. And so we realized we needed to step back and target companies like McDonald's or Walmart uh, for their beef purchases or Nike or Timberland for their leather purchases. So we approached McDonald's and they said, okay, we'll change, and we said, great. We approached Walmart, they needed some more cajoling. Uh, we approached Nike, and they changed their leather purchasing. And we approached Timberland, and the CEO said, no, we, we don't think we'll change. So about 65,000 phone calls and emails later, and a few days later, the CEO completely changed his mind and said, you're right, we don't know where our leather comes from. We don't know what the suppliers are doing. We aren't sure if there are human rights violations from these cattle ranchers. Although we know so the opposition wasn't really opposition. The opposition uh, might have been at that particular point. You know, I'm really busy. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know why you guys are here. Um, this is kind of off my radar. I've got right. other things to do. Um, no. Yeah, I think the opposition was really the cattle ranchers in Brazil. And so we went to companies like, you know, uh, Timberland and Nike and said, do you realize that these companies use slave labor, are destroying the rainforest? Do you know what's in your supply chain? And, and, the, and the Timberland uh, CEO's uh, opposition might have been very shallow until he received exactly. the information right. that you were able to share with him. And so you have much. a person who is right. not of ill will, right. just a person who's, who, um, who uh, might not be as knowledgeable, later on becomes knowledgeable, mm -hmm. and shifts his policy, shows some flexibility, and shifts his policy, shifts his ideas, right. um, and, and moves his, his whole company in right. a different direction. That's, uh, it's, it's, it, it deserves a lot of credit. Yeah. Des you deserve credit for bringing the information to him. He deserves credit for, uh, for making the shift in response to it. Absolutely, and because of that shift that he made, um, the cattle ranching company in Brazil negotiated with our office there and said, what do you want? They agreed to no more cattle ranching on deforested land, and they worked with us to pass a ban on any cattle ranching that caused deforestation in Brazil. What's really interesting is when you see organizations, when you see um, companies shift back into a consciousness of the, of the full ecosystem, of how they interact with their customers, their suppliers, with this world, you see great good coming out of that. I think you can. I think companies have a lot of power over all of the companies that supply them. And so when companies do step up, many of them can make a real impact. And in order for you to have that conversation, what kind of information did you have to gather? We had to gather a lot. I mean, we had staff in Brazil dressed up as Bible salespeople 
um, because in Brazil we've had staff with bounties on their heads, uh, a lot of the deforestation done there is by organized crime. And so we had uh, our staff and volunteers in Brazil dress up like Bible salespeople and travel through the bush to all the local government offices and find out what land was owned by whom, what was being illegally logged, so that we could actually track what was happening. Um, we've had to do research on, uh, by using satellites to figure out what are the biggest areas where the deforestation is happening, happening illegally. So we'll do a whole range, and then we'll do really deep analysis into the supply chain of every company mm -hmm. and figure out which companies are actually buying from you know, this lumber mill or from this cattle ranch. Um, so once we've done all that and can show that these uh, destructive products have gone all the way up to the consumer product in the U.S. or in Europe or elsewhere, then we'll approach the companies and say, in many cases, we know your supply chain better than you, and we think you need to look at this and change this. And sometimes just that conversation works, and sometimes, um, like in the example of Timberland, it took a little bit of cajoling, and then they came around and really led on the issue. So you identify an issue. You then do, an, do a very deep analysis to find out what the causes, the drivers are that cause this issue to, mm -hmm. to uh, take, take place. You actually track through the different threads down to the sources. Right. Then you develop a policy you propose the policy, and then the next piece is a communication and marketing uh, piece of this, and an advocacy piece, and you then, with your partners, need to develop the actual solution and then see the solution is implemented. And then post-implementation, you have to track to see whether the solution is actually having the desired impact. It's a very sophisticated operation requiring a supply chain of its own. Right, absolutely. Yeah, we, you know, it's, there are very few environmental organizations that have 450 people in India like we do, or mm -hmm. 200 people in China, or 80 people in Brazil protecting the Amazon, for example. So it takes, it takes significant coordination, and all the green pieces are, are independent entities, uh, but we work to coordinate quite a bit because the corporations that are destroying our environment, and that could help them, um, are global, and the threats are global, and so in this era you need environmental groups that are global that can really tackle these problems. And I was going to ask you about the organization structure. So you have a decentralized organization. This is not a top-down organization. Describe how this works. Well, I think that you know culture matters more than structure many times, and so we aren't centrally controlled. We're all independent organizations, but we also are all here for a really clear mission, you know, and we're here to to solve the world's greatest environmental threats, and those by their nature are global. You have deforestation, you have global warming, which is global warming, um, you have the destruction of our oceans, which are not any one country's territory, and so I think that Greenpeace is just a very globally minded organization, and we've realized that many of the threats are in countries where the governments have, you know, the governments are fairly weak on enforcing laws, uh, where there's a lot of corruption and where often you have to collaborate and bring pressure to bear from all over the world in order to change a policy even in one country. Um, you know, in Brazil or Indonesia, the, what we end up doing is often taking so many customers away from the logging companies or the cattle ranchers that they say, okay, what do you want? And they agree with us. But then the problem that they'll have is if their competitors aren't following the same policy, right. they're in trouble. So what we end up doing in countries that often lack good government enforcement is getting companies to want laws and companies wanting those laws to be enforced evenly so that they can do the right thing, don't have to worry about us taking their customers anymore, and you know, still be competitive in their market. I believe that what also is happening is that there is a consciousness that resource needs to be redefined. Resource is not only the minerals that one can extract, or the, or the cattle that one can convert into uh, nourishment or uh, leather for uh, various products. Uh, resources are about um, a, a, a life that one can enjoy as opposed to um, a, a, a situation where that is dull and repetitive and crowded and, and impoverished. Um, you have, in many respects, uh, infected others with that, with that consciousness through your actions. I think so, and I also think that people, you know, people fight for what they love, and so I think some people 
fewer and fewer, but some people grew up in areas that were wild and just found that to be an incredibly spiritual experience or found that they could find peace there, that quiet that you're talking about. Um, the Bush administration put out a study that said that about half of us will get cancer in our lives and about 63% of those cancers are linked to environmental factors. Um, so sometimes we fight for the people we love, you know? And so I think whatever it is that people love and cherish, whether it's a place or the people that they love, that's something that's being taken away from us. And we have an economy that really ignores the very foundation of that economy. And so several years ago, it was the fact that 80% of our medicine originally came from nature. And as we wipe out many of our forests and many of the species in this world, the wealth and just the, the fact that we could keep our loved ones around a little longer, we're losing that and we don't even know it. And so a lot of our economy and our lives and the things that we love in this world are really dependent on nature and there's not a monetary value on that. But we know that it's the very foundation of our society, it's the envelope that holds us. Um, and we're destroying that pretty quickly. And so Greenpeace and many other groups are saying, you can't measure this, but you can, but you have no idea what you're losing, you know, as we quickly grind through these things as if they have no value. How does governance work at, at Greenpeace? Do you have an international board, uh, international advisory groups, and so on? We have an international secretariat in Amsterdam, and that has a board that governs it. Um, in each country, we have our own boards. And so in the United States, we have uh, a nonprofit with its own independent board. Um, it's registered in California, and that board just makes sure that we manage the money that we're given by our donors incredibly well, um, that we run clean books, and that we are effective in our mission. And um, in terms of how the boards interact with each other, or do they interact with each other? Are, is there a, a uh, place where uh, boards can, can share their ideas at, at that level in terms of the mission and the vision uh, for the organization? Yeah, once a year all the board chairs get together and mm -hmm. they talk through just, you know, being a board chair is a real skill and governance is a real obligation and duty and so they'll get together and, and share experiences, share skills, um, talk through how to best govern Greenpeace ethically and in the, you know, both to achieve our mission and to honor all the people that give us time, give us money and really invest in us so that we can do this work. And how do you, how do you manage your volunteer uh, uh, base? Do you have special functions within Greenpeace? Because you do have quite a few volunteers. We do. I mean, there are, if you're a company, you often view people as costs. If you're a nonprofit, you view people as your only assets in many ways. Um, Exxon and other companies just had a meeting where they were trying to pick apart and figure out how to deal with Greenpeace. Um, and one of the comments in their documents that they had was that well, Greenpeace only has this many staff and this much money, but don't be fooled. They have all this leverage in the form of people that volunteer and give their time. Um, and it's true. We are so much bigger than you would think on paper because people really care and people will invest their time and get involved in our campaigns. So we have entire programs that are just about how we engage people in our campaign work because we wouldn't have gotten those 65,000 phone calls to the head of Timberland in two days were it not for people across the country volunteering and supporting our campaigns. What's so interesting, because while you're um, uh, developing your strategies to shift uh, Exxon's behavior, Exxon is developing its strategy. Uh, is, is Exxon trying to shift your behavior or resist your efforts to shift their behavior? How does that dynamic play out? Um, Exxon in the past has worked to put us out of business. Um, and you know, there, we just w went through an IRS audit and we were one of the first IRS audits that was politically motivated since the Nixon era. And we passed with flying colors, and so our supporters would be happy to know. But the What is the evidence that it was politically motivated? Well, there are two things. One was that the people in the IRS told us that, um, so that's one. The other is that we know that Exxon funded a group called uh, Public Interest Watch, I believe, where they gave $120,000 of the organization's $124,000 budget. Um, that group then said we were laundering money, started to raise a bunch of questions, got that in some of Rupert Murdoch's papers. Um, next thing we know, a couple unfriendly Congress people started pushing the IRS and the Bush administration to audit us. And we had the IRS come and say, you'll never do this work again, and wag their fingers at us when they came to audit us. We turned out fine, but Exxon has 
really gone out of its way to figure out ways to, to stop Greenpeace and put us out of business. Is there a way to work with an organization like Exxon? Well, I think there are some instances where you can work with almost anybody, as long as you keep your principles. A lot of the oil industry right now is getting into the natural gas business, and the natural gas business is incredibly dirty. Um, and so Greenpeace generally supports just a rapid transition to clean energy without investing more in natural gas infrastructure. But as they get into the natural gas uh, business, they have an incentive to work to undermine the coal industry because that's their competitor. And so suddenly you see some oil companies interested in a carbon tax, which would drive up the cost of coal and help the natural gas industry. You know, there are, in, there are instances where we might support a carbon tax, they might support a carbon tax for very different reasons. Right. Um, but once in a while, interests can come together. Um, but I also think that in general, if you look at what scientists say, and really the vast majority of the world's scientists say, they say that we can't burn four-fifths of the oil in natural gas reserves and coal reserves that companies know they have. And so fundamentally, Exxon is based on, their market value is based on their reserves of oil that they could drill up and burn. If we're going to stop global warming and stop really catastrophic consequences, ultimately Exxon just can't make the money that it wants to make. It's, it's, it's just so fascinating. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to just mention in terms of the, the programs for the, that Greenpeace are, are advancing right now? You know, one of the most exciting programs is what consumers across the U.S. are doing. Um, people all over the country have been pushing their grocery stores because grocery stores sell half of the seafood that's sold in the U.S., half of the fish, you know, half of the shellfish. Um, and consumers have been pushing their grocery stores to change that. Over the last six years, that effort from consumers has reduced the endangered fish being sold by 20% in the U.S. in the major grocery stores. One sees the initiatives on sustainable uh, fisheries and, mm -hmm. and, and harvesting of, yeah. of fish. And, and Greenpeace is, is, is part of the drive for that, uh, for that sustainable uh, fishing. Absolutely. Well. In fact, we rate all the different grocery store chains and tell consumers who they should push and where they can push. Um, and we've seen really dramatic improvements in a lot of the major grocery store chains across the country. It's so fascinating that the different techniques that are being used, use, use of brand, uh, use of direct action, um, use of, of uh, research and policy work, uh, an investigative journalistic um, uh, approach to mm -hmm. advocacy. Uh, these are various uh, tools in, in your quiver, and over the years you've, you've developed those uh, in part by observing what other people are doing. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think it's, in a way, we've just figured out what we have to do to make an impact, and so it's been it's been both a focus on what we're great at and getting better, but also improvisational and just saying, how, do we, how can we prove that this wood or this fiber that's in this product comes from that forest and can we? Or how can we show um, the chain of custody of where this fish came from? Um, and then how can we push companies or major institutions to change things systemically rather than us needing to always do it? Well, Phil Radford, thank you so much for spending the time with us. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you for having me. Thanks.